how do we walk out our faith on a practical level? The world is full of trials, hardships, suffering, and turmoil, yet we are called to consider it pure joy as perseverance is developed within us. And so we walk. How do we walk out our faith on a practical level? There's so many things happen today that gives us the right to be outraged, yet we are called to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. And so we walk. How do we walk out our faith on a practical level? Is reading scripture enough, or do we need to live out what it says? As we pray for the needs of others, is that as far as we go, or do we find out that we are often the answer to our own prayers as we put our faith into action? And so we walk. We tame our tongue, submit to God, resist the devil. We're patient as a farmer, quick to confess our sins, and pray powerful and effective prayers. And so we walk. Well, hey, I got an important question to ask you on a snowy Sunday morning. Uh, and you know what the question is, and so come on, get extra excited. Uh, for the people that stayed home today, you gotta you got to fill in the gaps. The people that said, is this a snow day? It's not a snow day. Oh, it's a, it's a day, the day that the Lord has made. We'll rejoice and be glad in it. But come on, let's ask this question. Let's get a good response this morning. Who is excited to get into the Word of God today? Yeah, come on. We know this about the Word of God. The Word of God can change our lives if we let it. And so uh, let's let the Word of God seep into our hearts today and do uh, something amazing in us. We just want the Word of God to transform us uh, from the inside out so we can be more like Jesus. Uh, and so I'm excited to open up the Word with you today. I'm excited to continue our series. We're in week number six, just almost at the halfway point. Next week we'll be at the halfway point of the series that we call Walk, going through the book of James, come on, learning from James, the half-brother of Jesus, what it means to walk out our faith on a practical level. And so this morning we're going we're gonna to jump right back in uh, to where we left off. We left off on chapter 2. We're going to jump into chapter 3. And where we left off last week, James was talking about uh, not just talking the talk, but walking the walk, living out our faith. Not having a dead faith that just talks, but having a living faith that, that manifests in works and in deeds and in actions. And now uh, James shifts gears and he begins to talk about the way that we talk again. He says, hey, what you do is important, but also, let's just not throw out the talking, though. What we say matters. And he, he, he teaches us that this morning in this teaching that he gives us about the taming of our, our tongue. And so in James chapter 3, we're going to read verse 1 through 12 this morning and unpack this scripture. Uh, and it's going to be good. Look at your neighbor and say, it's going to be good this morning. Okay, we'll do that one more time. Look at your other neighbor, the one's a little more interactive than you say, neighbor, it's going to be good this morning. Okay, come on. Some of you are speaking by faith, that's okay. <laughs> Heard some Mr. Roger neighbors out there, that's good. Come on, James chapter 3, starting verse 1, this is what James writes. He says, not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault and or anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships for an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder uh, whenever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great force is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and it itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. 
Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt uh, spring produce fresh water. That's a lot to unpack this morning, so we're going to need God's help. Let's pray. God, we're so thankful this morning again for your word, Lord, knowing that it can transform our lives, Lord, knowing that it can cause us, Lord, to be more like you when we become doers of your word. And so, Lord, I pray, God, Lord, let us listen well, God. Let us open up our hearts and our ears. God, let it seep into the depths of who we are today, Lord. At the same time, God, would you, God, help us to shift, Lord, this morning to be doers of your word. We love you, God. We are so thankful for who you are, what you're doing in Heart Church, what you're doing in Missoula. And we trust you with everything we are. In Jesus' name, everybody said? Amen. 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 Well, the title of our message this morning is Taming the Tongue. And I want to do something just a little bit different this morning. We're, we're, we're kind of a, a nice uh, a, a family group this morning on a snowy day. And I just want to do something a little bit different. Is that okay? We're going to have some fun in church today. Is that all right to have fun in God's house? I get some smiles, some nervous smiles. I need two volunteers. We have these, these Heart Church uh, sweatshirts, uh, and I want to know who wants to win a sweatshirt today. I just need two volunteers. It's going to be really easy. All you have to do is just read something. It's super easy. Come on, I need two volunteers. Anybody? I'm going to get some voluntolds here uh, in a second. Okay, we got, oh, come on, we got Angie up here. Get up, get up here, Angie. Angie's competitive. Who, uh, so we got Angie, and, and who else do we have uh, this morning? Who else wants to come? Sean, you can get up here if you want. John, you want to get up here? Okay, we got Sean, the camera guy. He's got the camera fixed. I'm not going to move anywhere. Uh, you, got us, you got everybody in frame here, Sean. Get up here, buddy. Come on. No, we're going we're gonna to stay just like this. We're not going to move at all. This is a game called Tongue Twister. Tongue twister, oh man, tongue twister. This is gonna be fun. What I'm gonna do, I'm gonna hand you each, we got two rounds. I'm gonna hand you each a tongue twister, and I'm gonna give you 20 seconds apiece to say that tongue twister as many times as you can. Linda's gonna keep tally of how many times you say it, and uh, they just put her on the spot, uh, and I'm gonna keep time. And so uh, we're gonna go ladies first this morning, and so Angie, you get the first one. Get a, get a second to look at it here. I'm gonna give you 20 seconds on the clock. This is gonna be really good. Uh, yeah, it's a word and a tongue twister. Don't worry about it. Okay, here we go. We got it. We can put the tongue twister on the screen too, so everybody can play at home. Here we go. Twenty seconds on your mark. Get set. Go. The stump fell on a stump and thunk the stump stunk. But the stump thunk the skunk stunk. A skunk sat on a stump and thought thunk the stump stunk. But the stump thunk the skunk stunk. Skunk sat on a stump and thunk the stump stunk. But the stump oh, thunk the oh, skunk no, stunk. A skunk sat on a stump and thunk the stump stunk, but the stump thunk the stunk. 20 seconds. So we're going to be, was that three times? Four times? Come on, Angie. Wow. Good job. But they, it should be thunk. <laughs> oh, stump. No. The, the, stump, the stump thunk the skunk stunk. Right it's thunk, <laughs> like you're thinking, a thunk. There you go. Okay. <laughs> Sean, can you beat that? I, I doubt it. That's okay. We're going to give it a good, honest try. Here we go. Take a good look at that. Um, there we go. You ready? Okay. Here we go. He's, not, he's so enthusiastic now. He's like, why did I come up here? Here we go on your mark. Set. Go. The 33 thieves thought that they thrilled the throne throughout Thursday. The 33 thieves thought that they thrilled the throne throughout Thursday. The 33 thieves thought that they thrilled the throne throughout Thursday. The 33 thieves thought that they thrilled the throne throughout Thursday. The 33 thieves thought that they thrilled the throne. Oh, throw. Right there, it's 20 seconds. How many did you have? Sean, you got five in there, buddy. Come on, you're ahead. Let's go. Okay, this is the last round. So right now it's four to five. Is that what we got? Okay, four to five. Here we go. Uh, you get this one. Take a good look at it here. You feeling good? You feeling confident, Angie? Okay. Here we go. Don't let her fool you. She's playing possum right now. Can you mark? Get set. If you must cross a course, cross cow, across a crowded cow, crossing, cross the cross, course cow, cro across the crowded cow, crossing carefully. If you must cross a course, cross cow, across a crowded cow, crossing, cross the cr cross, course cow, across the crowded cow, oh, crossing carefully. If you must cross a course, cross cow. Okay, I think you got what, two? All right, good job, Angie. That, that, that would be hard. 
That's a good one right there. Angie, you did well. I will still be on the first time through. Okay, here we go. This is the last one. This is Sean's one here. here okay, Sean, take a good look at it. Let me know when you're ready. Okay, you're ready. Here we go. <laughs> on your mark, get set, go. Betty bought a bit of butter, but the butter Betty bought was bitter. So Betty bought a better butter, and it was better than the butter Betty bought before, old brother. Betty bought a bit of butter, but the butter Betty bought was bitter. So Betty bought a better butter, and it was better than the butter Betty bought before. Betty bought a bit right there. How many times did you get? Okay, and so you were up one before. Sean wins, everybody. Hey, give it up for Sean. <laughs> Sean, here you go. This is... Yeah, if, if we don't have your size, we can try to exchange it, but there's limited sizes left. Hey, and we'll just let you know. That's a fun way to let you guys know, too. I'm letting everybody know, even my staff. Starting next week, uh, next week in Easter, we're having, we have a few uh, sweatshirts left. We're going to have a half-off sale. And so uh, if you want to grab them, they were normally 30 bucks. They're going to be 15 bucks starting next week. So if you don't have one yet, uh, go ahead and get one. If we don't have your size, uh, we don't have your size. That's okay. Just wear a larger size or uh, be like me. Have to lose some weight and shrink into a smaller size. You'll be good. All right. Well, hey, that was a lot of fun uh, this morning doing some tongue twisters with you. Uh, for some of us, listen, for some of us, uh, it's hard to control our tongues to formulate the words when we do something like a tongue twister. How many people would have been able to do that this morning, get up here and just like do it more than they did? Oh, it's pretty hard. Tongue twisters are hard. But what James is writing about this morning in James chapter 3 is far more difficult to master than any tongue twister that you can imagine. James is teaching not so much about uh, the little muscular organ that's in between your, your, your top teeth and your bottom teeth. Uh, he, he's not so much talking. It says tongue, but he's not really talking about the tongue. We know this, that he's talking about our speech. He's talking about what we say. He's talking about the words that come out of our mouths. And so with that in mind, let's go ahead and unpack James chapter 3 this morning. Uh, and I, I want to give you our first thought today, and I like this one. The tongue can be our greatest asset or our greatest liability. Now that's a, I don't know if you know this or not, but it's 100% true. Your tongue, the words that you say, the speech, the words that come out of your mouth, your tongue can be your greatest asset or it can be your greatest liability. Now this muscle thing, the tongue that we have in the mouth, there's nothing inherently good or bad about your tongue. But there is something good or bad about the words that you speak, that your tongue helps formulate. Uh, Jesus tells us this in Luke chapter 6, starting with verse 45. He says, a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. And I'm a full, firm believer in that. I think Jesus is 100% right that whatever you are full of, what you fill yourself up with, whatever is in your heart will eventually come out of your mouth. Now, some people fake it really well. They're good talkers, but eventually that's going to catch up with them. Whatever is in your heart, Jesus says, is going to come up out of your mouth. You know, words are a reflection of who you are really on the inside. Words can reveal your character. A tamed tongue is a sign. What's it a sign of? When you have a tamed tongue, when you're able to control your speech, it's a sign of spiritual maturity. Your flesh is kept at bay and your spirit's in the driver's seat. You got a, you got a spiritual Vin Diesel Fast and furious. I live my life a quarter mile at a time. He's sitting, your spirit's sitting on the driver's seat when you have a tame tongue. Now, I can dare guarantee you today, everybody in this room, every single person here, when you hear the, the, this message and what we're talking about and the subject matter, and everybody here can think of probably one or two people, probably three or four people in your lives and say, that would be a good word for them today. Oh, my Aunt Matilda should be here this morning. She needs to hear this word. Come on, my coworker, they would they need to hear a word like this today. Come on, I know some there, I got I got people in my life that need to hear this word. Can we just do all of ourselves a favor right now and just leave those people out of our mind for a second? Because I want to challenge you with this thought this morning. This word is for you. And this word 
is for me. How do, how, Pastor Matt, how do you know this word is for you? You're our pastor. You're the one teaching the word this morning. Well, A, the, the best sermons that I preach are usually ones that I preach to myself. And, and number two, James tells me that this word is for me. He, he says this in, in the very first verse of chapter 3. He says, not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. Oh, man, I hate that verse. It's the worst. But I got to own that verse. Those who teach, those who, who stand in front of people and teach the, the gospel and teach scripture, they'll be judged more strictly. Well, why is it? You know, aren't we saying that we should follow the call of God in our lives? And, and you, know, we, you know, James is saying here we shouldn't, not everybody should be teachers. Now, you need to remember something about the early church. The early church looked very different than how we do church today. Now, don't get me wrong, we have many similar elements. We, we, we preach the word, and we have fellowship together, and we do things like communion, all things that the early church did. But if you were to go to the early church and go to heart church today, they, they look really different. They have a completely different format. You see, James, remember if you're here on the first week, we know that James is not just the half-brother of Jesus. He's also the leader of the church in Jerusalem. And he's writing this letter to, to Jewish Christians scattered all over the known world. And, and the way that Jewish Christians did church was different from us. They, they did what they knew. What, what did they know? They knew that... Their Jewish faith did something called the synagogue, and they went to synagogue. And the way that they worshipped at the synagogue was anybody could speak, stand up. Anybody could grab the scripture and read. Anybody could be a teacher to anybody. And yeah, they had other teachers and, 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 and Pharisees that, that would speak, but also it was custom for everybody to just kind of chime in when they wanted to chime in and give their opinion and give their thoughts. And now James is, is speaking and writing to the church uh, mostly Jewish believers, and, and at this point in, in the history of the church, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of Christians kind of scattered all over the place. When thousands and thousands of Christians know this, that they didn't meet under one roof. They had little houses. The Bible says that they meet in each other's homes daily. So imagine all these hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of houses that are, that are all over the place. And each house didn't have just one leader. Everybody got to be a leader. Everybody got to be a teacher. Everybody kind of got to chime in and give their opinion. Now, now James uh, is, is kind of giving everybody uh, some, some good teaching right here. It says, hey, maybe it's not a good idea for all of you to stand up and uh, to teach everybody about the Bible in a, in a public setting. Yes, share your faith. Yes, tell people about Jesus. But not everybody is, is called to do that. In fact, I want to let you guys know that, that those of you who stand up and, and kind of want to be the teacher and, and kind of make a name for yourself, like, listen, you're going to be judged more strictly. That, that the words that you teach need to line up with the actions that you, you have. And then James goes on to say in verse 2, he says, we all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. You know, James uses that word, we. What does we mean? It means we. It means you. It means I. And James in his writing includes himself. Listen, nobody is perfect. James who is the leader of the church in Jerusalem, James, who has blood relation to Jesus Christ as his, as his half-brother. Uh, James says this, hey, I stumble too. That the words that I speak sometimes don't line up with, with my actions. And, and, and the things that I say sometimes aren't pleasing to the ears of, of God. And he says anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect. Now, now, this word perfect, we look at it and we think of perfection. And we think, is this an error in the Bible? Because I thought we could never be perfect until we get to heaven. No, listen, the word perfect there that James is using in the Greek is, is the word that we translate into the word maturity. James is talking about our spiritual maturity. That, that is, sometimes uh, we'll, we'll shoot off the, at the mouth and we get it wrong. But sometimes when we begin to get it right, it's a reflection of our maturity. You and I can be mature in our faith, but we are not perfect. You are not perfect. I'm not perfect. We're not perfect. Only Jesus is perfect. Right? 
First Peter 2.22, 2, 2, here's, here's an imperfect man, Peter, very imperfect man, writing about his perfect Savior. He says he committed no sin, and get this what it says about Jesus in his mouth, and no deceit was found in his mouth. Sometimes we're going to get it right, sometimes we're going to get it wrong, but I'll let you know Jesus is perfect. We're not perfect, but we can model spiritual maturity. So if we can model spiritual maturity in what we say, we're able to have good character, James says, in our whole body, meaning inside and out. The words that we speak on the outside and, and the thoughts that we have on the inside and the things that, that we harbor in our heart on the inside. He said, hey, you can have good character on your inside and your outside. They'll line up. Then James gives us an example, gives us two examples and verse 3 and 4, and the first example he gives us is the example of horses. How many people in this room like horses? Anybody? Where's all the horse people at? <laughs> to you guys. Come on. I know Linda likes horses. I'll post at my house. Um, Every once in a while, the backyard of our, of our house in, in, our, in our neighborhood, the hillside, sometimes there's these wild horses. There's four wild horses. Call them the four horses of the apocalypse. Reminds me of Jesus is coming soon. But these horses will show up, and I'll post pictures on Instagram, and Linda gets so mad. Because every time Linda's been to my house, uh, she's like, where are the horses? I'm like, they're not here today. And she gets upset. It's really cool. But when I see the horses, Linda, you got, you got to see the horses sometime. When I see the horses, I'm just in awe because they are ginormous creatures. I'm like, oh, my goodness. You know, you see horses on TV, and you, you see horses from a distance. But when, when they're, like, right there, you look at them like, that's giant. What a, what a massive creature. It's amazing to see, and I always joke around about with my wife, say, I'm going to lasso one of those one day. Montana State Law says, if I can lasso one, it's mine. It doesn't really. Uh, I don't know if it does or not. Who knows? But I know this. If I caught a horse, I wouldn't know what to do with it. Because I'm a, I'm a city boy. I'm wearing Nikes. You know, we, we used to do this. when I, Back in my youth pastor days, we used to have a, a, a summer camp that, that we hosted called Wild West Summer Camp. And we would take all the middle schoolers from our, our church, and, and we'd use high school students as leaders and other adults uh, in a cooking crew. And we'd go out the middle of nowhere to this little town called Bickleton, Washington. That was no joke, no exaggeration. Population, 91 people. And we would come in more than double the size of the town with our 145 people that would show up. And uh, we had a guy at our church that had property out there in Bickleton. And so he had acres and acres and acres of land. And a creek would run through his property. And, and we'd set up. Everybody would sleep in tents. No showers for three days with middle school students. Woo! <laughs> Glory. <laughs> you, were, you were very thankful for things like running water when you got home. Trust me. No electricity. No running water. Uh, man, we'd do worship out, you know, out... Uh, just out in the open and a campfire. And, but one of the things that was a big hit of our camp, there was, a, there was a man named Tony who was a cowboy who would come to camp with us, and he would bring his horses, and he'd set up a corral. And, and part of the free time was students got to sign up, and they got a little bit of time on the corral on the horses. And they'd be led around by, by different leaders that knew about horses and that Tony would trust and got to lead the middle school students around. And we made them wear helmets to keep them safe. I know we were very cautious and, uh, but while the students were off doing other activities, Tony said, I'm going to take the, any leader that wants to go out just through the wilderness on the horses. And I'm like, yes, like take me. And so myself and my friend Michael, who is our tech director, um, he got on these horses with Tony, and he showed us how to get on the horses. He showed us how to work the reins and said, hey, this is how you get the horse to go left. It's how you get to go right. It's how it stops. It's how you go. And he says, and, and I'm, I'm telling you this just in case because really these horses are trained to follow my horse, and they're going to follow me. And so wherever I go, these horses are going to go. But if for some reason your horse gets away, it's important to know these things. We're like, oh, okay. And so he says, you ready? We're like, yeah. And he's like, all right, here we go. And he, he, he starts off at a pretty good pace. And we're going like straight up these like really steep hills. And there's trees. And we're ducking and dodging trees. It's pretty exciting, man. I'm bobbing up and down. I'm like, this is so cool. And he's like, just, these, these horses are all-terrain vehicles. I love it. It's so fun. And we, we get finally over the top of this one hill. And, and we get to the top. And, and, and Tony stops his horse. And my horse stops. And, and there's this big open field. And Michael's horse does not stop. It goes at an incredible speed. Suddenly this horse is in full gallop. And, and Michael forgot everything he knew, what Tony told him, how to get the horse to stop. And he's just holding on for dear life. And you can hear him just calling out, Aah! 
And, and it was funny at first, but then we realized, oh, shoot, Michael is in trouble. And suddenly like this, Tony and his horse, they take off like lightning. And he catches the horse, and all he does is reach out and just takes the rein and just a gentle on the rein. Not pulling him back hard, just a gentle. He goes, whoa. And the horse goes, whoa. And stops. And Michael's just like, <gasps> it was awesome. <laughs> While city slickers like Michael and myself probably have no business on horses uh, because we don't know what we're doing. We are not experienced. Experienced riders like, like Tony knew exactly, knows exactly what to do. Knows how to manipulate the rain to control this small metal bit in the horse's mouth to get that horse to turn left and to right to maneuver this amazing uh, a beast wherever they want it to go. You know, the second example that, that James gives is the example of a ship. He says this, he says, or take ships, for example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder uh, where it, whenever the pilot wants to go. Think about how big ships are. You know, even in James' day, ships weren't little rowboats. They were, they were pretty large. And you have these large, massive wooden ships in the water, and they had to get from port to port. And yes, there's a strong wind that blows the sails of the ships and gives the ship some power and some speed, but that ship will never get from one port to another unless there's an experienced sailor that knows how to take this little tiny piece of wood in the back of the ship and steer it just right so that the ship goes where they want it to go. It's an amazing thing. What an incredible, incredible asset. An equestrian, those who ride horses, the bit in the, in the horse's mouth, what an incredible asset that is to the rider. And what an incredible asset that little rudder is to the sailor that sails the ship and gets it from port to port. And you know what? What an incredible asset. Though it is small, what an incredible asset our tongue can be in the words that we say. Your tongue, your speech, and what you say can direct somebody's life. It can steer somebody towards the kingdom of God. It can do good for others around you when you open up your mouth and you say something good and say something from God out of the abundance of your heart. Proverbs 18.21, I love this verse, says the tongue has power. The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Come on, think about that. Life and death is in the power of your tongue. What you say has power. What you say has weight. What you say matters. I remember uh, about 20 years after I graduated from high school, I graduated in 1995, uh, and 20 years later, I remember I was at my church uh, in Camas as a youth pastor. I was in my, my administrator's office where we're talking about our next youth service. And then suddenly my cell phone rings. And I look, and it's a friend from high school I haven't talked to in almost two decades named Jeremy. I said, whoa. I said, my, my thinking was, I bet he hit my number on accident on his phone. He's probably trying to call somebody else. But I picked up the phone anyways. I'm like, hey, hey, Jeremy. He's like, he's like Matt. He's like, I'm, I'm glad you picked up. I want to talk to you. I'm like, yeah, I'm like, long time, no, no speak. He's like, yeah. He says, hey, I just want to let you know, because I'm living for Jesus. I was like, you are? And he's like, yeah, because I gave my life to Jesus. He says, I'm faithfully attending church right now. In fact, I meet every single week with my, my pastor. He's discipling me. I'm like, Jeremy, that's amazing. He's like, yeah. He says, I wanted to call you and let you know, because back in high school, it says, you would never shut up about Jesus. And you talked about Jesus all the time, what he'd done in your life, and what he did in your heart, and, 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 and the good things that he's done for you, and the blessings that he's given you, and how he's gotten you through tough times. And he goes, I just want to let you know, because way back when, 20 years ago, I listened. I listened to all those words that you said, and they seeped into my heart. And I want to let you know, what you said had an impact on my life, and I'm living for Jesus today as a result of some of those words that you spoke. It's like, oh, I'm not crying, you're crying. <laughs> But your words, listen, they matter. What you say matters. There's power in your words. 
You can use your words, listen, to praise God. You can use your words to, 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 to go to God in prayer. You can use your words to comfort others. You can use your words to encourage each other. You can use your words to build each other up. You can use your words to proclaim the gospel. And you can use your words to tell the story of what God did in you. And when you do those things, they're impactful. When you do those things, they're life-giving to people. Come on, I love Revelation 12, 11, what John wrote uh, about, about how the saints of God defeated the devil. How did they defeat the devil? It says, they triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. I think that's an amazing thing. Your tongue is an incredible asset. And it's also at times your greatest liability. James goes on to say in verse 5 of our main text, he says, likewise the tongue is a small part of the body. But it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire. A world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body. Sets the whole course of one's life on fire. And it is set on fire by hell. Those are some pretty strong words, James. Now, I, I like chicken wings a lot, and so I make my own chicken wings at home. And in this last batch, I used some, some scorpion uh, uh, hot sauce on my, on my chicken paper, or my, my chicken wings. And it, it, my tongue felt like it was on fire from hell when I ate those chicken wings. But listen, James is saying, no, 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 listen. Like, your tongue can do so much damage in someone's life. It's like, it, it's, like it's set on fire by hell. It, the, the smallest spark... From your tongue can start a fire. Small sparks create big fires. I, I, I don't know if you guys remember. I remember it well because I still lived in the northwest. But back in 2017, beginning of September, September 2nd, 2017, there was some 15-year-old kid fooling around with firecrackers uh, in the, the Columbia River Gorge area, in Eagle Creek in, uh, Canyon, and he took a firecracker, one firecracker, and lit it and threw it down into the canyon, and that firecracker ignited a spark that burned down 50,000 acres of some of the most beautiful scenery you'd ever see in the Northwest. That fire burned for three Months solid before the fire department can, can proclaim that we have the fire contained. From a little firecracker, from a little spark, did over $36 million of damage. That's some of the, the hiking trails, my favorite hiking trails that I've ever hiked. You still can't hike them till this day. And they'll be closed down for years and years to come. Over a little spark. That's, James says, that's what our tongues do to people's lives. That you just say a couple words out of anger. You say a couple words out of jealousy. You say a couple words that, that are pointed at somebody as a weapon. And it does damage in their lives. James tells us that our lives are set on fire by hell itself. The things that we say in somebody's life when it's an asset can change the trajectory of somebody's life and point them to Jesus. And also the things that we say can also be our greatest liability and point people away from the kingdom of God. I say, I never want to, if that's a Christian, I never want to be like them. With our mouths, we talked about all the good things we can do with our mouths, but also with our mouths, we can lie. And with our mouths, we can slander, and we, we can curse. And with our mouths, we can gossip. And with our mouths, we can tear someone down. With our mouths, we can harshly criticize someone. With our mouths, we can verbally abuse somebody and leave scars that will last for decades to come. Listen, there might be somebody sitting in a therapist's office this week because of maybe something you said to them somewhere in, in your life. You know, we, 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 we do that playground talk sometimes, and we believe it in our minds and our hearts. Sticks and stones can break my bones, but 
Words can never hurt me. What a lie. What a lie. I'm on the playground, we'll stand there and say, I'm rubber, you're glue. Whatever you say bounces off of me and sticks onto you. No, it doesn't work that way. Words are destructive. Words hurt. James continues on, and I want to give you our next thought this morning before we jump back into the script. Our next thought is this. And this is, this is, I got bad news and I got good news for everybody this morning. Bad news and good news. Who wants, who wants, who, bad news or good news? Which one do you want? Who said good? You're going to be disappointed. You'll get the good news later. I'm going to give you the bad news first. The bad news is this, and it's our next thought. You cannot tame your tongue. Life and death will flow out of your tongue, and the what will Decide what will be life or death is if your tongue is tamed. But the bad news is you cannot tame your tongue. You can't do it as your pastor. Listen, I can't do it. Not even my wife, who's way holier than me, can tame her tongue. Even Angie Logan, the master of, of uh, whatever this was, tongue twisters, can't tame her tongue. Sean can't tame his tongue. You can't do it. Is that, some, is that some encouraging thoughts for you today? I'm going to ask the band to come up. We're going to close. I'm no, just kidding. You can't do it. James says this in verse 7, in verse 8. This is what he writes. He says, all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. Then he says in verse 8, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. You can't do it if you are human. How many humans do we have in the room today? Raise your hand if you're a human being. Anybody? We got some aliens in the room. That's good. Raise your hand if you're a human being this morning. Show of hands, who is human? Come on, if you're raising your hand right now, I got bad news for you. You cannot tame your tongue. It is an unruly evil. It's full of deadly poison. But he, he starts off by talking about the, the birds. He's all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. What is he doing there? He's mirroring the creation story. He's mirroring Genesis 1.28 where he says, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful uh, and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Listen, you and I, the fact we are human, the fact that we are, are, are human gives us the power and the authority to rule over animals. That's something that we can do. We don't need God's help to do that. God says, hey, you're human. If you're human, you can rule over the, the animals that are on the ground, the animals that are in the sky, and the animals that are in the sea. I was amazed uh, 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 a while ago, a couple decades ago, I went to SeaWorld and I saw this trainer riding on the back of Shamu, the, 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 the killer whale. I'm like, look at that. What a marvel that is that we can tame a, a killer whale and get on the back and ride that thing through the water. And they don't let them do that anymore. So I think one ate a, a trainer, but that's a different story for a different day. But we can tame animals. We can tame a whale, but we can't tame our tongue, it's unruly. No human can tame the tongue. That's how unruly it is. You think you have control over it, then suddenly you're spewing out poison and venom at people you love. Those are the people you love. What about the people that you don't love, <laughs> that, that you label an enemy? And we as, as humans need to understand it's hard. We can't tame our tongue. The Apostle Paul, this is what he says about humans, ready? This is what Apostle Paul says about mankind. Uh, in Romans chapter 3, verse 13 through 14, he says this, Their throats are open graves. Oh, Pastor Paul, that's so encouraging. Thank you. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. You're powerless if you're a human to tame your tongue. We can't do it. James shows us the duality of our tongue and exposes our character uh, in this next verse. In verse number 9, he says, With the tongue 
We praise the Lord. Anybody, anybody enjoy worship this morning? Come on, we got to come in here. We got to lift up the name of Jesus. We got to sing out. Come on. I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Because all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And James says, no, that's not all you have. Because you'll praise the Lord with your tongue. With our tongue, we'll praise our Lord and Father. And with it, we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, he says, this should not be. We come to a place like this and we'll lift up the name of Jesus with everything that we have. Yet in the back of our minds, we probably have a small list of people that says, I can just get them alone in a room. I can give them a piece of my mind and tell them what I think about them. We'll, we'll praise God and worship the name of Jesus in a place like this with everything that we have. Yet there's, there's people that we, we don't know, that aren't friends, that aren't family, people that we know maybe from a distance or don't know at all. Often celebrities and politicians and people of influence that are, are notable people uh, in the news or on Instagram or on Facebook we, or, 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 or maybe people groups or maybe different communities that we don't understand and don't care for their values at all we 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 got a list of people like that in our head too and we say hey uh, man i get a chance if i ever see them face to face or or even not i'm gonna call, talk about them behind their back uh, on in in the way that i talk to my friends the way i talk to other people or i'm gonna open up facebook i'm gonna write something about them and and we'll, we'll say things that aren't pleasing to god we'll say mean hurtful poisonous things about people that we don't even know we say, oh, I know what their, their values are. I know what their character is. I know what their lifestyle is. But, but, but God says, hey, hey, that, those are points. We want to speak life or death over people. And if your answer is death, that means you can't tame your tongue for sure. We'll get out of a place like this after we worship Jesus and we lift up his name. And, and we'll get in our cars. And it is time for Costco hot dogs and pizza. Can't wait to get that one dollar and fifty cent hot dog and a and a Coke. It's the best deal in town. We're driving up Reserve with our Heart Church sticker on the back of our car, and our Heart Church sweatshirt on our chest, and then suddenly on Reserve, somebody cuts us off, and woo, we point him to Jesus, <laughs> and woo, we'll start to we'll honk our horn, and we'll let something come out of our mouth. That thank goodness our windows are shut and our doors are shut. But guess what? You still said it. Now, I don't care if somebody's a man or a woman or, a, or, a, 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 or what ethnicity they are or if they're gay or they're straight or if they're a Democrat or if they're a Republican. When we speak, we need to speak the words of life. And speak the words that come from the heart of Jesus. Because why? James says that you're talking to people. You're saying words to people. You're spewing out venom to people. To those who are made in God's likeness. That God created them in his likeness. And that, 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 that we are here on this planet not to speak words of death but words of life. I don't like their values. I don't like their lifestyle. Great. Speak Jesus to them. Don't come at them with judgment. Come at them with love. And watch God do something in their midst. Watch God do something in their hearts. Watch God change a life. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, it should not be. You know, last week James gave us this short rhetorical list of questions. What I like about James, he does a lot of rhetorical questions all throughout the book. And so this week he gives us another short list. He says this, can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? He says this in verse 11. What's the answer to that? No. He says, my brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives? What's the answer? Or a grapevine bear figs? What's the answer? The answer is No. It says, neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Listen, remember, the source of our problem isn't so much our, our tongue, the muscular thing right here. It's what's in our heart. 
That's the problem. That's the source of the problem. And the problem with our heart is that we'll try to be fresh water in church and salt water out in the world. And we'll behave differently. And God says, no, 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 no. You gotta, don't, don't try to be a fig tree but then have olives growing out your branches out there. Don't try to be a grapevine and then try to grow figs out there. Be one person. Be whole. Let your spirit and your, your mouth and the words that you say and what's in your heart, let it all be one good chunk of good character that out of your mouth could flow something good from a good God to people who desperately need a touch from him. Let God, if your heart's hurting, listen, I I know this, and this is an old saying, hurt people hurt people. And it's true. But you know what? When we let God begin the healing process in our heart, we can still be hurt, but know that we're being healed. And when we know that we're being healed, guess what? That healing is transferable. That healing is contagious. That we can open up our mouths and speak words of healing and words of life. So the bad news is that you can't tame your tongue. And as as Hannah comes to the keyboard, I want to tell you the good news this morning. You can't tame your tongue, but here's the good news. God can tame your tongue. Oh, man. I'm so thankful for that today. Because I've tried. I've tried to get my speech under control. I've tried to say the right things. I've tried to say words of life. And it always seems like the harder I try, the, the worse the things that slip out happen but I know this that I can't do it in my own power but God can do it that God can tame my tongue how can God tame our tongue how does he do it he gives us tools to do it we still there's still an effort from us involved but now we're not doing it in our own power we're doing it in God's power how do we tame our tongue well it's all over in scripture it's all over the bible the first thing we need to do is we need to be born again when we're born again Ephesians 5 or, or 2 Corinthians 5 17 tells us Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. The way that you used to speak, the way that you used to talk, the words that used to come out of your mouth are a thing of the past. When you're a new creation, God begins to transform and shape and begins to tame your tongue. That some of us, we got tongues like a wild bucking bronco where the cowboy's just trying to hold on for a couple seconds. But God says, no, 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 no. I'm going to tame that tongue. And the words that come out of your mouth are going to be life-giving to people that you encounter. Because I'm in you. And out of your heart flows your mouth. The second thing we can do is be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Ephesians tells us, 5, 18, verse 19, is what the Apostle Paul writes, says, do not get drunk on wine. Hey, if you're drunk on wine, you're probably going to say some things that you're not supposed to say. Do not be drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Now, we'll quote that part, but that's a lot of us stop right there because we just talk about it. We just don't want to talk about, yeah, don't, don't get drunk. Be filled with the Spirit. That's the other option. But why? Verse 19 says, be filled with the Spirit, speaking with our mouths to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. When we're filled with the Spirit, how are we talking to each other? through the Spirit with songs and psalms and and words from the Holy Spirit. You know that in the Bible, every encounter somebody has with the Holy Spirit, when they're filled with the Holy Spirit, one of two things happen in their lives. Their tongues are loose to either proclaim who God is or to sing His praises. Their, Their tongues are loose to either preach the gospel or sing the praises of God. Every single time. Look it up. Go through the Bible. Find out when people are filled with the Holy Spirit. They're either, their tongues are loose suddenly to praise God or to preach the gospel. Come on, you want to tame your tongue? You want God to tame your tongue? Get a fresh dose from the Holy Ghost today. Be filled with His Spirit. Come on, I just got two left for you here this morning. Number three is use caution. Caution! When you are about to open up your mouth to say something to somebody, especially when things are heated, especially when the situation is elevated, use caution and ask yourself three questions about what's going to come out of your mouth, about what you're going to type in the hit send on Facebook or Instagram, about what you're going to say over the phone, about what you're going to text. 
ask yourself three, these three questions. Is it true? Is it kind? And is it necessary? Is it true? Is it kind? And is it necessary for me to say what I'm about to say? Is this going to burn the whole house down or is this going to pour water on the fire and build a bridge back to this relationship? Proverbs 15.1 says this, A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. And then number four, I think we can all do this one. Be prayerful. Be prayerful, but not just what's in your mouth, but what's in your heart. The psalmist write this in Psalm 19, verse 4. He says, May these words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. I love this prayer. This is a good prayer to pray. God, the things that I say and the things that are in the depths of my character, God, let them be pleasing. <laughs> Tame my tongue, God. Fill my heart with your presence. Come on, let's bow our heads. Let's close our eyes. If you're here today, on the first one on the list, you want to tame your tongue, you got to be born again. You got to get that sin out of your life. You got to let Jesus be your Lord and Savior. If you're here today and you say, I want to, I want to respond to that. I want to, I want to be f- close to God and far from sin. And I want God to begin to tame that tongue in me through his salvation. I need to be born again. Maybe I'm not living like I'm born again. And I need to start living like that today. If that's you. And you want prayer? I'd love to pray with you. Can you just lift up your hand wherever you are on the count of three? One, two, three. Yeah, good. Yep, that's awesome. My second question is this today. You say, I, I've i tried to tame my tongue. Whatever area of your life you're having problems with, maybe, maybe you cuss like a sailor and you just don't know how to stop. Maybe you say mean, hurtful things to your spouse or other family members or to friends. Maybe, maybe you're guilty of, of talking about other people that you don't even know that live thousands of miles away or live on the other side of the country and you say horrible things about them every day and you, it's, you, this is revealing your character today that, well, there's things in my heart that maybe God needs to pull up. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, God, be pleasing to you that's you today and you need strength for your journey and that you need God to tame your tongue today. Can you just, wherever you are, can you just lift up your hand? I want to pray with you. Come on, yep, yep, I got my hand up too. Yep, come on, that's good. That's good. Jesus, I'm so thankful today that we don't have to do it, you do it. That you give us the power and the strength. Lord, that you're the one Lord, that we don't have to yank sin out of our lives and just try to be good. You're the one that comes and saves us and makes us born again, that you give us your grace and your forgiveness to live right and to tame our tongue. Lord, I'm so thankful today for your Holy Spirit that rests on us and dwells in us. That in times when we don't know how to pray, we pray in moans and groanings and in tongues. And at the same time, when we live life, and we encounter people, I pray that you would tame our tongue, Holy Spirit. That what comes out of our mouth would be out of the abundance of what's in our heart. Lord, I pray, God, that as we encounter people, and yes, we're going to encounter conflicts, and yes, we're going to encounter situations we don't agree with, Lord. Help us, God, to use caution and have a gentle answer, Lord, that shows love and that shows grace. Lord, I pray, God, help us to pray often that prayer in some way, shape, or form. Let the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be acceptable in your sight. Oh, Lord, our rock and our redeemer. I pray, God, that Heart Church would be a church that doesn't just say the right thing. It says the God thing in every situation. It would be a church that speaks love and peace and grace and life over those, God, that would be considered our enemies. That those, God, who, who hate us, God, those who are intolerant of us, God, that we would still speak the words of Jesus over them. That we would see them, God, saved. That we would see them transformed. That we would see them rescued by your mighty hand. We thank you. 
We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.